Okay, the subject of this interview is Mr. Frank White, and today's date is Friday, January 20th, 2012. And there's a part of the Civic Voices International Democracy Memory Bank project. Mr. White, would you please affirm that you have signed the deed of gift authorizing the Memory Bank project to make this interview available to future researchers? I confirm that I have signed the contract to make this available for your research project. Thank you. Now we will begin with our first question. So, uh, can you walk us through uh, the Rondo neighborhood as you remember it, or where you lived at the time when you were kids? Yeah. Um, the Rondo neighborhood as, as I knew it, and, and probably what is publicized today, would be University Avenue on the north. The south would probably be Marshall, the west would be Lexington Parkway, and the east would be, as I knew it, would have been western, but a little bit before me, it would have actually been Rice Street. So, so in, in terms of a geographic location, that's the area in St. Paul. Um, the street itself, Rondo, was kind of considered more like the business street where businesses were on. People lived on like Aurora or Fuller or Central or St. Anthony. Some people lived on Rondo and then some people lived on Carroll and Igohart and Marshall. So, so in terms of geographically, those are the places, but Rondo kind of was like the, the, the business district, so to speak. And that business district, excuse me, was primarily between Dale and Western. Um, was there prejudice in the neighborhood, or was that like not as around? You know, there wasn't biased in the Rondo neighborhood primarily because it was it was mostly African American people that lived there, and 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 the reason people were there, however, was because of bias. And in, at the time when people came here to live, you know, they were directed to like, oh, you can go live there. There were a few people that lived outside of that area. But primarily, that was where it was defined that you could live if you were an African American family. There were some white families that lived there, and there probably were a few um, Spanish families that lived there. But primarily, it was African American. So, so there wasn't bias necessarily, but it was bias that placed us there, and 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 that's. Within the Rondo community, you felt very good about where you were at. There was pride about living there. And as a young person, I didn't really realize at the time that, that that's where we could live. Because initially, my family, we lived out on Dale Street and, I, um, and went to Como Park Elementary School. So we lived on Dale Street near Maryland. And then we moved back into the, the Rondo community when I was like in fifth grade. And even then, I didn't really understand that that was our place. So I didn't understand that there was bias because my friends and everyday people were all related to my, not related, but interacted with my family, and, and that's where we went. It was The bias part came in you know, when I went to school, when we went outside of the Rondo community. That's when I realized that there was bias. Um, how were your impressions about like, be, like, the bias that was around? Um, I went to two schools um, that that were considered a junior high, Marshall Junior High at the time, which also was a high school, and and then I went to Mechanic Arts. Those schools probably had the most diversity in the city. So on one hand, the bias for me began to happen when I went to junior high. 
and, and understanding while some students then were, would treat African Americans different or attempt to. But even there, the majority of my friends, again, were African American, although, again, I was pretty social, so I had a lot of friends. The real discrimination came when I started to go to some of my friends' homes and their parents would like question why they were bringing me over to their to their home. And while they were open to a certain, I, I understood there was something different and, and, and after maybe going there the first time, not necessarily getting asked back. So it, so I could, I could tell that there was bias. In school, there was bias from some of the students. As I, as I interacted in, in some of the stores on Selby Avenue, um, you could tell that there was bias. When you walked into the store, there was always a certain look of like, are you in the wrong spot? Or they would continually watch you throughout the store, like there was something wrong with them. So my impressions of, of, of bias were, were um, confusing because up until that point, I didn't understand bias because I, I was centered in a situation where our family, we, we didn't have a lot of money or anything like that, but we didn't really, um, how can I say, in today's terms, we probably didn't struggle. It was a challenge for my family. I never know how they made it with all of our family. It was pretty big. But I went home every day and we had a, we had a good life. We, we enjoyed, I enjoyed being with my family and my friends that lived. And so that's who I interact with. It was only when I went outside of that comfort zone where things began strength, to become strained. So. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, you were an athlete when you were younger. Um, how was that for you? Um, for, for me personally, it was very difficult. My father was a, an outstanding athlete and so was his brother, my uncle. So every time I attempted to go play and they knew who my, that I was my father's son, it was like, oh boy, he's going to be a star. And so it was very difficult. I liked athletics. I played baseball first. Then I ended up playing football and basketball eventually. And, and I liked to be involved in sports. And I think part of that was an influence from my father. He never said, I want you to play, but I would always go with my father. And, and I would always want. So I think it was kind of like I wanted to be like dad. I wanted to be like my father. So I, I enjoyed it, it was, it was fine, and even with that pressure, I still played. Um, I didn't notice really any bias, so to speak, in sports at that early age, um, because the teams that I played for, um, there were other kids of color. We were like a, a diverse team, and, and even getting in, into junior high, same thing, because of the school that I went to, and then at Mechanic Arts, again, while I knew there was some bias in school, the teams were made up of a very diverse, you know, our teams were very diverse, and so I didn't really have a sense of, of bias from those people that were around me. There were a group of people that I just didn't hang out with that I knew were biased. And if I suspected that they were, um, and or knew that they were, they were just people that I didn't hang, chose not to hang around with. Sometimes there would be, again, words that would be exchanged, taunts, in, in, in words, but that was a part of growing up in school, and, and sometimes you met those taunts with taunts, and in and, and, uh, a sense of survival, so to speak. And, and uh, so, so sports for me was a good thing. I learned a lot of things from from athletics, and uh, I was fortunate to play for some very good people. Um, and and uh, I just I it was something that I enjoyed. I could I could play, and and I learned that if I put in a, the time to get better, um, I enjoyed the sport more. And and eventually maybe there was some some awards that went with that. So it was kind of like I I could be I could be an athlete and get 
better and by getting better I could see some some reward and the reward the reward itself would just sometimes be the performance so so sports to me was a good thing and I continued after school so um, what did you play for any high schools in particular I played for mechanic arts high school which is no longer in st. Paul but but it was a, a one of the most diverse high schools in, in, in St. Paul at the time um, that I went. Um, Central probably would have been the other most diverse. Um, and, and so Mechanic Arts has a lot of famous people, again, that graduated from that school. St. Paul has got a lot of famous people that have an impact nationally um, and, and have had an impact on, on things that occurred in our country, so. Um, in your community, were were they like active together in like neighborhood watch type things or? You know, neighborhood watch, as we know it today, is is um, it's interesting because it when I was younger, in the Rondo community, and probably most neighborhoods, I would say, you knew who lived in your com in your community. So it wasn't like they were really watching, but I could be three or four blocks away, and, and, and if somebody saw me and they thought I was doing something wrong, I, a parent would come out of the door and say, I'm going to call your mom and dad. Everybody knew everybody. And everybody took care of everybody. So again, you know, if, if, if somebody saw me, no matter where I was in the neighborhood, they generally knew who I was. And they would say, the caution would be, I'll let your dad know if they thought I was, excuse me, doing something wrong, or I would find out later on that so-and-so said, oh, I saw your son, Frank, and he was over here or whatever. So it was great communication. So to a certain degree, it was community watch. But it wasn't what we would term community watch today, you know, where you would have signs up where you really get together and, and, and say, you know, we're going to protect our neighborhood. Back then, it was something that you did because you knew everybody. And there weren't any meetings, but there was a connection because that was your neighborhood. So. Um, were you, like, later on, were you involved in, like, helping people out in your community or doing certain activities to help? Yeah, I, as, as I got, as I grew up, my family, um, both parts of my f family have, have, have been families that have helped in the community. Um, my, my, f my father's parents uh, active in the church and in the Rondo community. My mother's family, the Rango family. My grandfather, Francisco Rangel, Rangel. Is is was the honorary consulate to Mexico because there was no consulate here in St. Paul. The closest consulate was in Chicago, but people here on the west side came to my grandfather to fix things. Very well respected. So as I grew up, that was what I grew up with. I would always see my family helping. As I got older, I didn't really have a plan to do that, but as I came out of the service. And I and went into college, I could see a lot of the struggles, and that was in the 60s. I, I started at the University of Minnesota in 68. And that was a, a, a very difficult time in our country right now, the 60s, and all of the things that were going on. And uh, so while on campus, there were a lot of things that, that I got involved in that, again, were even on campus, we were trying to establish rights. and. And there was the Morrow Hall incident. If people looked in history again and the takeover of Morrow Hall by African-American students, I wasn't one of the students in, but I was a part of the larger group. As I came out of the service and started working and started finding myself, a little bit earlier I talked about, you know, how you find yourself and, and that type of stuff, how what gives you pride. One of the incidents that I will share that helped, sh that helped form who I am today 94 was being constructed and it completely came through the Rondo neighborhood and devastated that community. One of the claims was that it, there would be more jobs. Well, some of the jobs weren't happening 
and then they kept making promises, but African Americans weren't getting the job. So when I came out of the service, I was looking for jobs prior to going back to school. Uh, the principal that was at Mechanic Arts and then went to TVI, which is now called St. Paul Technical College or something like that, right up by Cathedral. Well, he said, oh, you should be an electrician. You had good math aptitude, so you should be an electrician, so you should be in the trades, which is where African-American people were being told, you know, I, I kind of wish I was, would have, because they electricians make a lot of money. But you got that great aptitude. So I went and I, and, and I was going to be in this apprentice program. The first work site I went to was right, at, right off of, at Virginia and Western, and they were building homes there. Those homes are still there today. When I walked up to the job site, the supervisor came over to me and he said, right in my face, he said, Whew, we thought they were going to send one of those niggers here. And I looked at him and I said, well, two things. I'm not a nigger and I don't, who do you think I am? And then he kind of stumbled and stammered and whatever. And so I worked at that work site for the morning, lunchtime came, and I left because there was nobody that I could have went to to tell that story. And even if I would have, nothing would have happened to that guy because that was the time. So then and there, when I went to school, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to graduate, I'm going to become something. And as I did that, I didn't graduate, close, but I think what helped define me was that I was going to help people because that was a very embarrassing and unfair situation for me. So as I ended up going into to my career in recreation eventually and, and working at for the city of St. Paul or the city of Richfield or the other things that I did in helping people, back to all of the stories about helping people, I always said I would, whoever I work with, I would always challenge the things that were unfair to people, whether it was me coaching, whether it was me as a basketball official, um, whether it was me as the manager of recreation in, in Richfield and people walked into our door and made comments or our staff would make comments to people that, that uh, were underserved or whatever, people of color. I was always going to be the person that was not going to allow that to happen. In the city of Richfield, I always spoke up for diversity. I always spoke up when those issues, again, even though Richfield didn't have a large, diverse population, I still wasn't going to let things happen without at least me standing up and saying things. So I think if you talk to people that knew me, they would say, Frank is always the person that's going to make sure things are 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 better for people, and that's kind of what I've done, and and and, uh, and that all came from probably we talked a little bit of earlier when we sat down and had lunch about your family values and where they come from and what that helps form you to be, and so for me that's what it came from, and then that one incident again of of uh, what that gentleman said to me at at that work site. So. Um, earlier you mentioned you were in the Air Force. What did you do exactly? Um, I worked in what they called supply. The department that I worked in was supply. I, um, I, I worked in an office and uh, after training. Well, let me go back. When I first went in, I got to play basketball right away. So my training in, in what was considered basic training in the next part of Tech School, I got to play basketball, which really made it enjoyable. And because I was someone that, because of my athletic talent, it allowed me some additional things that I could do that other, other uh, members of the Air Force couldn't do at the time in training. So, so that was a plus. And, and um, then the supply or career field that I was in, I actually worked in an office, and, and, in, and in essence, I helped manage uh, at the base that I was at, which was in Laredo, Texas. It was a pilot training base. I managed the office to make sure of the supplies that were necessary to take care of, of 
of uh, the the jet mechanics that that made sure that every time a plane went up and it came back down and something was wrong with it, the repair and the supplies for all of what was going on with the aircraft on the base. So I was involved in, in that swell supply and, and, and I was in just that part of it, which I really enjoyed because I learned a lot of things about aircraft at the time. Um, <clears throat> and in the service at that time, um, I was from uh, 64 to 67, uh, there's bias in the armed services and there was bias in, in, in the Air Force and there was bias on the base that I was at. But I think through sports, again, I, it, was, it allowed me to have an interaction with people that I chose to be with and not be around the other things that I considered crap or whatever. You know, so, so again, I think sports um, and my own openness to, to meet other people really helped and then it helped me seek out and find the people that I really chose to want to be around while I was in the service and and within the you know at the office playing sports or whatever it happened to be you know I always I always interacted with the people that were positive for me so um, while you were running like as I said the office of supplies and stuff did you know any like um, African American or Hispanic people that actually got to fly in the planes or go fight? The 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 base that I was at um, pilot training. I would say that ninety nine percent of the officer candidates that came in were were white. I don't remember seeing that many. Um, either Latino or African American pilots. There were a few, but very, very few. And, and again, 99%, it could have even been higher than that. And, there, and, and first of all, to be a pilot, I, I think the dropout rate for everybody was probably like 60%. I, I mean, it just, it was a very difficult thing to, to be. So everybody that came in didn't make it as a pilot, so it, it's a very intense training program. So, and again, I was just on one pilot training base, so you know there are a lot of other bases, but a lot of support people, you know, that were involved that were African American and Latino, but not many people in the cockpits. Um, <clears throat> back to I ninety four. How did that impact you uh, personally? I-94. Um, at the time it was happening, because I was still young, um, I was probably in junior high. Junior high at the time. And, and I didn't completely understand what it was. I didn't know that there were other options. I didn't know that they could have put 94 in another location. And, and so I wasn't completely in tune to all of, of, of what was involved. And back then, black and white TV. Like now, issues on TV are 24 seven. You hear them all the time. So back then, if you weren't in front of the TV, you and, and if you didn't read the paper, or the African American paper, you know, to get some other views, I, it, it was difficult to really track what was going on with 94. That was the beginning. But later, when I saw all of the homes taken and my friends having to move, and then the homes weren't, you know, they weren't replaced. They were just, they were bare lots. So there was a, a large part of the, the community between St. Anthony in Rondo that it, it just to me was devastating because there were no homes. And then they came in and they started digging this big hole, this big route of, of which today is 94. So for me, the impact ended up being very devastating. Now, as, as an adult and I look back, it, it, it really, my question is why this location? And even today, there's a part that I'm working on with the city of St. Paul. People consider Rondo to be 
the south side of 94. When in fact, if you were standing on the bridge at Dale that crosses over 94 and you look directly east, really 94 begins to turn in a southerly fashion towards downtown. It doesn't run parallel. So there's a portion that, that right now, um, and I'll try to give you a description here because it's another kind of an impact in its history to me and, and people don't really know this. If you were at Dale Street looking east and, and there's a ramp that goes down onto 94 and right there there's a school or three schools there and one big building off of Dale and what is considered Concordia but it's Old Rondo. Well, if you went down that ramp and you look straight down, almost straight down, you would kind of vision like going right in front of the Kelly Inn, okay? If you got off going west at Marion and drove along 94, it says St. Anthony. Between Marion and what is, and, and a little curve that goes to western, you cross a corner that is Ravu and St. Anthony. That exact corner is Farrington and Rondo. So that street bed right there is actually Rondo. So consider that if you're on the other side of Rondo, the south side, right now at Western and Concordia, there's a street sign that says Old Rondo. Well, that's not true. Across the road on the north side is St. Anthony. That street bed is Rondo. I lived at 409 St. Anthony, a half a block up from Western. Over Boys Club is on the other corner. So for me, and I'll go back to again, the things that, that, that are in my mind vividly about Rondo. I've approached this city about this. I've, I've approached the people that run the Rondo, Rondo Day celebration. I, I want to see history corrected. I've, got, I've given them maps, old plat maps that have been researched as a part of my baseball exhibit. And, and there is a current map that shows what I'm talking about that was put together by another gentleman that I actually played basketball against. His name is Jim Gerlach. He went to Wilson High School. Didn't know him at the time. We just played against each other. But he's done a nice job in his map. So to say all of that, for me, here's if the, the impact of Rondo, first of all, devastating the Rondo community. And now we have a situation where there's actually a part of Rondo that's still there. And the city has chosen not to identify that as Rondo. Why is that? And I've asked the city to put, all I want them to do is put the same old Rondo signs that they have at Dale and Rondo, um, St. Albans and Rondo, on top of that sign at Ravu and St. Anthony and at Marion, because that would identify that street bed as Rondo, old Rondo. And I think when people see the devastation, they'd have a better understanding of really the history of what happened when they took out that neighborhood to put in 94. Um, did, your, did you and your community take uh, some form of action to prevent that? or They did. I, again, I was so young. I, I know there was action that, that was taken. I can't tell you all of what that is because, again, at the time I was a teenager, so I didn't really understand, and, and I do rem remember hearing some things on the news, but it, w it was so few, and, and the people that were were uh, more involved, I, you know, I've, 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 t I've, I've spoke with them in the past, and they've told me some of the story, but you know, again, it what they didn't they didn't want it there because it just ripped the community apart, and that was the place where where people knew was a place that was safe for them, and in a sense, a thriving business area, because they weren't you know you you weren't allowed to go other places. Uh, a part of that was. Are you familiar with where the Lexington restaurant is 
on Grand and Lexington. It's like one of those, one of those name restaurants. African American people could eat in the Lexington restaurant. In downtown St. Paul, there were restaurants. There was a place called Woolworths, Grants. People couldn't eat or go in those places. And so if you understand the, where people lived and the businesses and what they couldn't do, you couldn't live. There are, there are covenants, there are deeds that still show if you research today, and I've done some of this, so it would say that the deed would literally say, cannot sell to niggers or Jews. I have a friend that grew up on Juno by St. Kate's. This guy's an attorney. Nice gentleman. I met them, found out that they, my, my daughter and his son actually went to Cretan and were in the same classes together, or at least one. Chance meeting. When I told him about my baseball exhibit and he has seen it, then he told me this story. They lived on Juno. His father decided that they wanted to get a bigger home, so they were going to sell their home. So at the time, they advertised it, and an African-American came, gentleman came and wanted to buy the house. His father decided to sell the house to him. A week later, the neighbors pooled together and came to him and offered $10,000 more to his father to not sell to the African-American. There are other deeds, my sister has one of them, that says, and she lives on Igohart, interesting enough, that says, cannot sell to niggers or Jews. So St. Paul was in a situation at the time, in Minneapolis also, same thing, that literally you couldn't buy a house someplace. So that's why the importance of the Rondo community at the time was a safe haven for people. It was a place where black people could own a business, or at least run a business if they didn't own the building. You couldn't do that anywhere else in St. Paul. You couldn't, you couldn't even go some places. I've done research and there's a, a, a location on University Avenue that said colored business or colored customers not welcome here. I could go on and on city council members saying comments about African Americans, very biased, in the 40s. One of the names is Maurer. And if you tracked who the Maurer family was, there's a big name in Maurer right now. Joe Maurer. Sorry. So, it's interesting that in history, when you track back here in St. Paul, the things that I'm sure this is the first time you've heard about people not being able to eat in first class restaurants, not being able to stay in hotels in St. Paul. So when people traveled through here, they actually stayed in boring homes. Jesse Owens, who traveled through here with Negro League baseball teams, they couldn't stay in hotels. Jesse Owens, graduate of Ohio State University, brought Hitler to his knees in the 36 Olympics and ended up making a living by racing a horse at events centered around Negro League baseball and barnstorming baseball. That wouldn't happen today. If you were a star in the Olympics, you would be well taken care of. So there's a number of things that go with the Rondo community and the times that were important. When you went to the movie, you had to sit in the balcony. You got some of the news that was going on in the world and in this country off of the, the things that there was a, a newsreel before every movie. They don't do that anymore because obviously there's TV, but a lot of people didn't have TVs or you listen to the radio. It's just a different time and, it, and it's hard to even explain or probably even imagine because what the four of you have grown up with is completely different because of technology and the way we provide information 24-7 now throughout the world.
just a completely different time. So that's some of the impact. I mean, we probably don't have enough time to go through all of it. But that's, think about you wake up one morning and somebody tells you, you know what, you can't eat at that restaurant, even if you could afford it. Or you can't live there. And your family said, you know, we want to move there. We want to rent there. Or we want to buy that house. Somebody said, sorry, you can't live in this neighborhood. You can't get a, you're driving from here to Duluth and you stop to get a bite to eat. And somebody says, sorry, we don't serve you here. It's such an impactful thing that I think, unfortunately, young people today, and this is not a knock on you, it's just the reality is you have no idea what it was like. And that doesn't make me or people older than me any better. It actually probably, you're so fortunate today to not even have to worry about some things. Now you have challenges today, but they're different kinds of challenges, but they're still biased today. That bias still denies people. It denies women, it denies people of color. It denies if you're different. So, so that's a part of still then that that's a part of the Rondo thing. You could you could stretch that to be because that was a part of denial. That was a denial of opportunities of where you could live, what you could do, even if you could afford things, where you could work, how much you could make. It was a different time. Um, did you feel like your economic freedom, um, the economic freedom of the community in general, was uh, kind of taken away during the construction of I-94? It, it, it was. First of all, it, it, it took away all of the black business on Rondo Avenue, which is where it was centered. Secondly, there was a promise in the construction project that African Americans would get jobs. They didn't. When they complained about the jobs, they said, oh, well, they were all skilled jobs. But there were general labor jobs, you know, people that went around and picked up stuff and you didn't really have to have any skills. But there were no African American people with those jobs either. The project that I had mentioned earlier in the interview, again, about the the homes being built in the area or whatever, and being the apprentice electrician. I was greeted with, in essence, you don't belong here. Whew. We thought they were going to, we thought they were going to send, or we were afraid they were going to send a nigger down here. But what did that have to do with the job? And then I left. So it had a direct impact to me, because I didn't, I didn't have a job anymore. It was only going to be a part-time thing for me anyway because I was going to school that fall. That happened in July. So I had to go find another job. Fortunately, I did at the packing house in South St. Paul. I didn't like that either for another kind of reason or whatever. But I stayed there and until, until the end of the part-time job that I had because I was trying to put money together to go to school. So there was a definite impact. People lost their homes probably weren't paid what they were. If people rented, they lost their place and they, they had to go somewhere else where the rent probably was going to be more. They didn't get any more money. They didn't get any more income. So the impact of taking that area took away where people lived, where people felt comfortable, and, and then the income thing, again, obviously, you know, that to a certain degree is a root for all of us in terms of how we can live and how we survive and, and uh, the things that we're able to do for our families. So there was a big impact, a, a negative impact by 94 going in where it did. Um, do you think the government was trying to help you in any way after the construction, like houses or jobs? There was no new construction for people to move into. They were kind of left on their own, and they had to move into areas of of, uh, of the city that, that weren't really welcoming to them. And if you look at how, how 
in, in communities where businesses and in, in, in the center city and how things move out to become suburbs and, and the decay that kind of goes behind or whatever for whatever reasons, you know, people were le moving into substandard homes, but there was nothing new moved. They didn't say like, oh, we're going to need this many more homes, so let's go build this new complex over here. That never happened. So did the government do anything? Remember now, I was a teenager. I was in junior high. So I don't really know everybody's individual, but I know what our family went through, and I have some other friends that would probably tell you the same thing. I don't think the government did anything. So. Um, do you think the government could have picked a separate route for I-94? <clears throat> What's interesting to me is that I, I don't know, obviously, any, any route that you take is going to, to impact the bed of the road, you know. So if they would have put it in another area to get to, to complete what they wanted to do, you know, if they would have went somewhere north of university, there still would have been an impact. Um, it, it's interesting to me if you look at here and if you look at places like in Kansas City and some other large communities, coincidentally, the route of the interstate paralleled where people of color live. So, did that include a plan to like okay to to displace people and, and, and whatever the plan was? I don't know that. Do people speculate that? Of course. So it, it's hard to know if there was a plan or not because none of that ever really was out there. It wasn't like like right now with the 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 state looking at where 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 can they put a new football stadium. There's well, at least options were presented. Obviously there's somebody's not going to like wherever it lands if it in fact is made because it's going to be devastating to somebody. But there weren't plans offered that way and if there were people didn't get a chance to vote on them. It was just a decision. This is where it's going to be. So. Um, how were things when you moved out of the area? We didn't move very far out. We moved from St. Anthony at 409 St. Anthony up to 573 Agohart. That was a half a block east of Dale Street, and it was already a place where African American people lived. So, so the change wasn't as impactful for us because we we had to stay in that area because of the limited income I'm sure that my parents had. Others that chose to move further out, I don't know how it impacted them. I'm sure it became more challenging because again, we're still talking about the 60s and we're talking about biases and we're talking about where you could live and couldn't live. And So I, I'm sure for those people that 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 moved out of the area into some areas where maybe they could afford and where they were allowed, I'm, I'm sure there were challenges that, you know, that they faced every day, even though they were allowed in, there was still going to be challenges. I mean, they, St. Paul has, has areas that are different today, but in, in even in the 70s, um, the north end of St. Paul was considered a place to be blue collar and, and vast majority white and and if you were African American you didn't want to be there. And you for sure didn't want to be there after dark, but you didn't want to be there any time. So the east side of St. Paul, completely different today, you know, and, and uh, so our our city has seen some some major changes and so it's hard to speak for other people, but I can't believe that when they moved out of the Rondo neighborhood that they were accepted with open arms in, in areas that were they weren't allowed before. 
Um, after this happened, do you think you're more aware of issues like within other places as well? I, I don't. I don't think I was more aware and, until I was older and, and maybe understood the impact more. And, and, and then I think I'm even more, uh, excuse me, more aware now because of the research that I've done because of my baseball exhibit and have tied it to some other things that I knew along the way and now it makes sense. I, I mentioned that, you know, in Kansas City, um, 35 and the interstates that are there went through the heart of where um, the 18th, 18th Street and Vine area, which was all African American, which it's where the Negro League Baseball Museum is now. But it went through there and took out a whole different, uh, the same kind of area. So why was that? You know, and, and, and I'm sure there are answers. So it's probably not until within the last few years that even more information has been made available to me because of research. Um, on a project that I did, and, and, and maybe at the time, because I was young, I didn't completely understand it, and, and I didn't sit down, my father didn't really sit down and say, you know, here's what's going on, that type of stuff. My father kind of like went to work every day, and, and, and my mom was at home, other than, than uh, maybe in August, she would go work a part-time job at American Linen very hot, sweaty place or whatever to make some money to buy some clothes for us to go to school. Um, they didn't really talk about those things, but part of it would be when I used to go to the barber shop at the time, like only guys could go in the barber shop, women didn't go into the barber shop. And, and I would hear the guys talk and tell stories. So even some of the things that you know I heard then probably make more sense. And I haven't, I don't remember everything, but that's where guys would talk about the the problems. You know, even uh, I mentioned earlier that it was a man's world and women were in, supposed to be in the kitchen, and that's the way it was. And so the men, when they got together, they talked about the issues, and I got to hear some of those as a, a young boy. And, and because I would be with my father. So I'm not so sure that while people complain because it was the way it was, they would get together and I'm sure there was frustration. And a part of that frustration was the, they, they couldn't do anything about it. So. Um, looking back, do you think there could have been more action taken to have better results besides Rondo being demolished? <sighs> looking back at our history, I would say no. I, 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 as I said, during the course of this, you know, there wasn't like other options available. There were, it, like now, people really look at options. Uh, although, again, sometimes the, the option might the most expedient, the most cost-effective way might be the, the least desirable to, to people. The light rail on University between Minneapolis and St. Paul, very impactful. In fact, some people that grew up at the time of 94 are saying it's the same thing. People that are putting it together are saying it's it, 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 we understand the devastation, but it's the least, it's the most cost effective. And that may be true too. There's another option, but at least they talked about options. Now they're at least talking about what can they do to make it easier. But if you talk to some of the business owners, obviously some of the business owners are being really financially devastated, but they're being giving low interest loans or whatever kind of thing. So. You know, and I'm, I'm not completely in tune to that, but could there have been those things happen at the time? No, because African American people weren't given a voice back then, or very little voice. Things were beginning to change, early 60s, but again, it took the late 60s to really bring maybe more of a struggle to the forefront that was going on in this country, and then as we get into the 70s, things maybe began to start getting better. 
But at the time, I don't see another way. It was a decision. And there were probably some people that stood up and said, this is not the right place. I'm sure there were some people that were maybe politically involved, but the voice wasn't strong enough, it wasn't big enough to make a change. Um, as things the same way uh, happen today, do you think uh, you would take action to help out with the people in the community? It's been effective. <laughs> I, 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 I would say, yeah, I mean, if, if, if maybe given the things that I know now and, 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 and if it was at a time when it was, I, this was my age and it happened today, back then or whatever, would I have gotten involved and, and helped and tried to make a voice and, and, and try to get an understanding of was there another location? If not, what can you do to help people? You're displacing people. What what can you do? Can you help give them a thousand dollars to go help find another place or whatever? You know. So when that came through, you know, there's got to be ways that you're just kicking people out. So would I have stepped in and tried to be involved? Absolutely. Knowing what I know today, at the time, I I, I was just too young. So. Um. Is there anything you'd like to add or say a conclusion, like advice to people who are like getting evicted out of homes or anything like that? I, I think one of the things that's extremely important for the people that are our are, are politicians, are, are the people that work in government in, in, for the city, um, the federal government that do planning is to to and I think with the light rail I, I think this happened um, is to make sure you get out and you and you first of all are are real transparent in in what you're doing you let people know what you're doing and then give people some options it might not change the route of the light rail but there are maybe some things that can be done to make the whole thing go better. If if you if you're gonna displace people, what is it that you can do? Excuse me. And and you know it, it it's hard for people today to see that well the light rail is gonna really help us ten or twenty years from now. It's hard for people to see that. Or for all of us to see that. Because we're impacted today and if you're just making it day to day you're not really concerned about people 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So what is the process that can help us all understand better? And sometimes we don't do a good job. We don't, we don't advertise it enough. I worked in city government. I know that there are things that we did to try to make it information available. You put it in papers, people don't read the newspapers. You send stuff in the mail to people still. There's so much junk mail that people get now, they don't read everything. I don't know, I don't have the answer, but I think it's important for people that are involved in major projects like that to do everything they can to inform people. And sometimes that might mean another meeting. If you've already got three set, then maybe you need to do four and five because you're going to miss somebody because people always come back and say I didn't know anything about it and and maybe we all need to take personal responsibility when we find out about those things I, it, it's it's not an easy process but for sure we've got to be transparent and we've got to let people know of, of things that are going to impact them and, and, and we're not doing a good job of that right now so. well, um, thank you for your time I think that's all we have. Okay. Cool.